Good afternoon. Um, welcome all to this uh, conference, uh, Democracy in a Digital Future, um, held jointly by uh, the Prime Minister's Office here in Iceland, uh, at the Research Centre at the University of Iceland, Iceland's Media Commission and the Icelandic Parliament. Uh, we will today and tomorrow be talking about uh, how the digital era changes uh, the way democracy operates and even the nature of democracy itself. Uh, we will start now uh, with uh, a panel and I'm going to chair today. My name is Jon Olafsson. I'm from the University of Iceland. Uh, and tomorrow we will continue uh, at one o'clock with another panel and, uh, uh, and a round table after that. We have four distinguished speakers uh, today. Uh, David Ransiman, uh, Mireille Hildebrandt, uh, and Shoshana Supov are going to speak here, uh, give their talks. But first, uh, the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdóttir, is going to give us an opening address, please. Dear guests, thank you all for joining us today and hopefully also tomorrow for a discussion on democracy in a digital future. It is nearly impossible to imagine any sector of society that hasn't been influenced by digitalization. It has framed political discussion, changed the way we interact with our friends and our loved ones, influenced the working environment in the media, and presented us with new threats that are potentially epidemic in scale in the last few years. The years of almost untamed enthusiasm about the benefits of the internet, of artificial intelligence, and of technology in general have been followed by a period that perhaps is best described as a tech Users, developers, and policymakers have begun to pay more attention to some of the unintended consequences that many of the most successful technology inventions of the past decade have brought with them and to the potential future consequences of what is yet to come. In my mind, it is clear that new technologies bring us opportunities and challenges. And it is up to policymakers to ensure that technology serves the people, that people are in fact taking active part in these changes we are seeing in technology, and also that they strengthen equality, sustainability, and democracy. So if anyone harbored any doubts on the urgency to have this conversation on technology on, and democracy, I am sure they have largely been put to rest by various events we have witnessed in the past few years. Just these past four years, it is easy to name examples that have challenged previously held beliefs and forced us seriously to consider the interplay between democracy and technology. We have seen important elections, such as the Brexit votes in the United Kingdom and the last two presidential elections in the United States, where technology has played a critical role. We have seen both social movements and social unrest incited and driven through the online social platforms. We see governments all over the world playing legislative catch-up te to technologies. We see other governments actively abusing technological power and threatening demo democracy through cybercrime, surveillance, or other means. And then we see an increase in governments, nonprofits, academics, activists, and industry leaders in the field of technology asking, how might we prepare to do better when looking towards the future? Our policies will need to be grounded in strong democratic tradition, and we must have the foresight to address both the challenging questions as well as the opportunities. We need to address how technology can be harnessed to enhance prosperity and well-being in society. What can governmental authorities do to steer these developments in a positive direction? And when answering these questions, it is important to remember that the impact of technology is not predetermined. It depends on how we use it. We have an opportunity to ensure that the benefits from productivity growth and technological advances is evenly distributed throughout society. 
that it ben benefits everyone and not just the privileged few. And what effect will digitalization have on gender equality? We need to be very vigilant about understanding how it will affect the genders differently and take this into account in our policy making. This goes for both how the genders will be able to seize the opportunities of digitalization, as well how the changes might have a different negative effect on women and men. I remember seeing once an example of this, an expert came and Googled the word human. And what came up was a picture of Donald Trump. So obviously technology is not neutral. It always, is, it always carries a lot of, uh, uh, let's say it, it, has, it always carries a lot of values with it. Now, dear guests, a key component on our policy making here in Iceland as it relates to the advance of new technologies such as, such as artificial intelligence has been to focus on democratizing knowledge. The guiding principle is this, we must harness knowledge, its creation and its dispersion throughout all of society to ensure that we never become a society of those who have or don't have, know or don't know, understand or don't understand. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has been an enormous undertaking for all of us in the past year. And our policy throughout the battle with the virus has been to provide the public with as much information about the virus as possible, broadcasting daily information meetings with the chief epidemiologists and other experts continuously for months. The results of a poll conducted by the Icelandic National Security Council's working group on information disorder in relation to COVID-19 showed high levels of trust in the domestic media and their dissemination of information on the pandemic, as well as very high levels of trust towards scientists and health professionals appearing in the daily information meetings. Other polls have shown high levels of trust in the government's action during this period. I believe that the emphasis on provi providing detailed and reliable information has played an important role in determining Iceland's response to the pandemic and participation in public epidemic control measures. People that have access to the necessary knowledge make sound decisions that benefit society as a whole. Now, another thing I would like to mention is that just in two weeks, we will launch an artificial intelligence challenge that will be free of charge for all, where we will encourage everyone to educate themselves on the fundamentals of artificial intelligence by joining an online course. This might seem to be a very small step in the grand scheme of things, but it is an important one. We all need to realize that this conversation is important to us. Technology is relevant to us, and it is ours to participate and ours to act in order to strengthen our democracy. Now, I will not keep you waiting any longer. I can't wait to hear the thoughts of the amazing speakers gathered here today and tomorrow and hopefully to join a few of them in a panel discussion later this afternoon. Thank you very much, and I hope we will have a fruitful discussion on this important topic. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, our next speaker is uh, David Ransiman. Uh, he is professor of politics at Cambridge University and, and host of the weekly podcast Talking Politics. He's the author of numerous works on democracy, most recently, How Democracy Ends. Uh, before uh, I give the floor to David, let me also point out that we are accepting questions uh, to the speakers uh, on uh, our website, etta.hi.is where you are probably following this conference anyway. And, but these questions will be taken only uh, after all the talks uh, have been given. So, David, please. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, to be joining you from Cambridge. Um, what I'd like to do, since I'm going first, is to pick up on some of the comments of the Prime Minister, and particularly the point where she started which is I think we're all aware that there's a kind of narrative arc that has emerged, a story about the relationship between democracy and the digital. 
and that we've seen a shift over a generation, say from the 1990s through to now, which is broadly speaking from optimism to pessimism. Well, if you think of this in terms of our hopes and our fears, our hopes dominated in the early phase and our fears dominate now. And it's become a kind of conventional wisdom that the early promise of the democratizing potential of digital technology has dissipated. <clears throat> so what I want to do in, in my remarks is to sketch out why I think that that story has taken hold and then to explain the ways in which I think it's a mistake. And I think there's a danger of us getting trapped in that narrative and it, it forecloses the future and we're here to talk about the future, but I'm gonna talk about the future through the past, partly because I'm a historian. I think there are three broad reasons. If you think back, <clears throat> those of us who can remember to the 1990s and the 2000s, for that early optimism about the ways in which the digitization of democracy would be an enhancement of democracy. That was the assumption. The first reason is I think because most people assume that this technology, digital technology was itself inherently democratic, that it had democracy written through it, through its structure, through its architecture. Essentially because what it seemed to be promising was a radical lowering of the barriers to entry to politics. Conventional representative democracy has quite a lot of barriers to entry. It's quite hard to get in, to be heard for citizens, even for politicians. And this technology seemed to strip those away. Suddenly this was an open and a level playing field in which it would be possible for all sorts of inputs and outputs, but primarily inputs to reach new audiences. Another way to put that related to it is I think, and this assumption still holds for many people, but it's certainly been challenged. The early optimism rested on a view that there was something inherently anarchic about what used to be called cyberspace, that the relative lack of rules and partly because the rules hadn't emerged, was a space for creative freedom, including in politics. And there's another way to put this, another word probably that captures it better than anarchy. And it's a word that's often used in relation to this technology. This is a permissionless space, the space of permissionless innovation. You do not have to ask someone to be allowed to try something new. That was a big part of the promise of this technology and again, conventional representative democracy of the kind that has dominated the Western world certainly and other parts of the world too, for more than a generation, for a number of generations. It's a form of politics where there are lots of permission structures built in. You can't just walk in. There are gatekeepers, there are guard posts, and this technology seemed to promise to remove those to make this more accessible and accessibility seemed an inherently democratic feature of the technology. I think the second reason for the optimism was an assumption that digitized democracy was going to be in competition with conventional representative democracy. That there was a sense that these two things could be set alongside each other, this new permissionless, open, innovative space in which citizens could come together, both with politicians, but also crucially with each other to do new things. And what was already seeming, I think by the 1990s, the more tired form of electoral politics turning around political parties, a professional political class, conventional forms of communication. And if you set this old politics against the new politics, one which looked tired, one which looked dynamic, the assumption was almost inevitably that the dynamic politics would win and that the old politics would either have to adapt or it would die. It would either have to be digitized to compete with the purer form of digital politics, or it would be swept away. And that almost seemed, I think, to many people like an inevitability. And it relates to the third reason for the, the progressive optimistic sense that this digitization of democracy was an enhancement, which is not simply a competition, but a kind of historical teleology and assumption about progress. One of the reasons I think it was thought that the digital would win out over the conventional, or you might even say the analog form of democracy was that it comes after. There is a sequencing assumption here. And it comes after in the sense that 
representative democracy, what we have come to mean by democracy, is an invention of the 18th century. It came to life in the 19th century and it came to dominate the world in the 20th century. And it was intimately associated with the technologies of those periods, but particularly of the 20th century. And one way to think about that is representative democracy seems to rest on transmission technologies, that is forms of communication and information sharing where different things are aggregated into a single source and then projected out. And this goes both ways. So representative democracy both aggregates voter inputs primarily into election results, not exclusively, but also into public opinion, which is then sort of corralled into a single number or a single decision. And likewise, the communication from politicians to the public was a transmission communication. The classic technologies of representative democracy in its dominant phase, 20th century, radio initially, but then television, and the technology that connects 20th and 19th century representation, the newspaper. Classic transmission technologies. Newspapers, <clears throat> how I used to remember them before they became what they are now. Newspapers are now very interactive forums, but once upon a time, not that long ago, a newspaper is where information news was projected out. There wasn't any interaction. If you could really be bothered, you could write a letter to the editor. And if you were very lucky, the gatekeeper would allow you a voice, very lucky. Now it's fully interactive, or at least as interactive as people can tolerate. Often they can't tolerate it because it becomes so contentious. Transmission technology seems to give way inevitably in historical sequence to network technology. Network technology, which is interactive, not one way. Network technology, which is dispersive, not aggregative. Although of course there are ways in which networks can be aggregated highly interactive, consistent with a kind of hive conception of how knowledge and information is shared. It seems that the sequence is obvious. One replaces the other. That's the optimism. So what happened? I think what happened is that by now, and by now I mean we're in the third decade of the 21st century. So I think the optimistic phase, and you can date the end of it to various points, the invention of Facebook, or they're not the immediate invention, it took a while for people to appreciate what was coming, the arrival of the smartphone, the evolution of cloud computing, the development of machine learning, phenomena of the last decade and a bit. But certainly through the 2000s, but particularly the 2010s, <clears throat> we've come to a view that all three of those assumptions are wrong. So again, I'll do this briefly. I think the conventional wisdom now is that this technology is not inherently democratic. And the reason that we've come to think that is twofold. First, because we have come to learn, particularly over the last decade, that this technology suits authoritarian forms of government. Authoritarian or autocratic regimes turn out to be both skilled and also able to use this technology for their purposes too. China is one example of that, but by no means the only one. And I'm thinking particularly here of the work of Ron Dybert and the Citizen Lab in Toronto. Over a decade, remarkable reports about the ways in which digitization and authoritarianism often go hand in hand. Lots of ways one might try to explain that and also try to explain why we missed it until we staring us in the face. But one, to relate back to how I put this earlier, I think a mistake that many people made is to assume that the permissionless anarchic nature of what used to be called cyberspace favors democracy, it doesn't. There isn't actually anything inherently democratic about anarchism. If there aren't rules, what tends to be favored are existing power structures. After all, power is constrained by rules, by laws, by norms. And if you are in a space where that doesn't exist, there is no reason to suppose that it will break up power. It's more likely to allow pre-existing power to get its way. Or to put it slightly differently, if you think about it, who's likely to benefit from permissionless politics? The people who are not used to asking for permission anyway. And the people who are not used to asking for permission are autocrats. The other thing that we've discovered <clears throat> is that this technology is e easily captured and it is captured not just by authoritarian regimes, 
but also by corporations and corporate forms of power. And I'm thinking here, and we're gonna hear more about this, of, of the path-breaking work of Shoshana Zuboff and others. Corporate capture has taken a couple of um, features. It has a couple of features that seem to push back against that democratizing instinct we had earlier on. The first is the tendency that we have learned, particularly over the last decade, of this technology to be consistent with monopoly or quasi-monopoly forms of capitalism. The capture by particular corporations of huge swathes of information sectors and then across information sectors. As Facebook <clears throat> loses its hold on young people, it simply buys up the platforms to which the young people have migrated. It's not actual monopoly, but it is something close to monopoly, coupled with the growing reliance of these corporations. And this is what they have in common with governments who are using this technology to resist those movements that would try and undo their power, the reliance on surveillance. This, as Shoshana Zuboff has called it, is a form of surveillance capitalism. Monopoly and surveillance coupled with growing authoritarianism has killed a lot of the optimism about the democratic potential of this technology. Hasn't killed it for good, <clears throat> but it certainly seems to have killed it for now. And that is a huge part, I think, of this story. Related to that is the fact that the assumption that conventional representative democracy would have to adapt or die in the face of this much more exciting, more dynamic form of democracy does not seem to have come true. Now, it's certainly true, again, as the, as the Prime Minister mentioned, that we are all increasingly aware of the ways in which democratic politics has been shaped by digital technology and the digitization of many aspects of the public sphere. And I think all of us are particularly conscious of how this can happen through and during elections. And we probably all are aware of elections that we think came out differently because this technology was a big part of how election campaigns were fought and indeed how it was very hard to regulate them in the old ways. Um, there's a book by Martin Moore called Democracy Hacked, which itemizes the many different elections around the world. So this is not just Brexit. This is not just Trump. This is a very widespread phenomenon. It's not just when populism triumphs. It has features in common across all sorts of different electoral systems. And yet when you think about it, what has happened here is that the technique of electoral politics has shifted. So the ways in which conventional democratic practices, <clears throat> of which the preeminent one is getting the vote out, getting people to vote for you, the fundamental essence of conventional representative democracy. The techniques for that have shifted, but the form itself, the project hasn't changed. There's something remarkably unchanging about the way most countries do their democracy while the techniques that people apply to that conventional form of politics has changed. Another way to put it is that we've had radical transformations in the information space, coupled with almost no change at all in many places, not in all places, but in many places in the institutional space. The institutions of democracy have been remarkably unchanging over the last 30 years, particularly in the world's most established democracy, so the United States of America, the elections look the same. So if I could just give one, if you'll forgive me, parochial example, but I was very struck by this, the last UK general election, which happened in December 2019, so just before the pandemic, the election that Boris Johnson won and it essentially settled the Brexit issue. <clears throat> That election took place in December, which is very rare in British politics. It was the first December election for nearly 100 years since the aftermath of the First World War. And though there was, as there has been in all elections in, in recent years, a, a huge emphasis on online forms of communication, Facebook played an important role in that election, including, crucially, forms of political advertising on Facebook. And there was a sense in that election, as there has been in a number, the Trump election is one, Brexit is another that if you simply got your news from the analog transmission sources, if you just watched the BBC or read a newspaper or listened to the radio, you would miss what was really going on. That sense still held that something was happening beneath the radar of analog politics. And yet the form of the politics, how that election both looked and came out, we could have been in December, 1919, 
similar political parties fighting similar sorts of campaigns with a similar sort of result, people knocking on doors. The fact that it was dark in the evening really mattered. Politicians going around on buses with simple messages painted on the sides of those buses. The election felt more old fashioned than it did newfangled, which would have been astonishing to anyone thinking about this in say the 1990s, that in 2019, an election would have reminded people of 1919, but it did. And then finally, the reason for, I think, the, the, the reversal of the hope is that that teleology, that sense of progress that the digital and the digitization of democracy comes after the democracy that we're familiar with, that also doesn't hold. And I think the reason it doesn't hold is as we've become more aware of the challenges we face as the digital encroaches on the democratic space. And as we become more aware that there is nothing inherently democratizing about simply letting this technology run riot through our public sphere, we have fallen increasingly back on the thought that we need the democracy that we're familiar with in order to redress the challenges of the new technology. In other words, we need to reverse that order and place old fashioned democracy after digital transformation in order to correct it, rectify it, indeed re-democratize it. You can think about this in a couple of ways. There are increasing uh, movements or at least currents of thought that suggest that facing, for instance, the new monopoly power, transnational monopoly power of the giant tech corporations, that what they need is to be more democratic they are themselves in their ways, highly autocratic. Uh, it's both a, a sort of conventional figure of speech and not a million miles from the truth to think that the court of Facebook around Mark Zuckerberg has more in common with a kind of medieval principality than it does with a modern democracy. The power at the heart of some of these corporations, the relatively unaccountable power, notwithstanding all the window dressing of ethics boards and corporate openness and corporate governance and all the rest. The fact that single individuals, often founder individuals, hold a kind of princely power over their courts to the extent that one might say that Facebook needs to move from the 15th century to the 19th century in political terms, even as it's shaping the 21st century. To have within Facebook real accountability would be progress. And what does real accountability look like? Looks, what does it look like? being answerable to, not just, and even this is a formality, shareholders, but users as well. Forms of communication, but also ways of expressing opinion that hold the people with power to account. And in that sense, I suspect many critics of Facebook would be grateful if Facebook could be democratized in a 20th century sense so that it could be fit for the 21st century. Or to put it the other way around, American politics, the recent presidential election saw a number of candidates on the Democratic side running on familiar platforms, promising to use the power of the Democratic state to break up the power of big tech. And how would they do that? By winning an election. If Elizabeth Warren had won, she had a platform which was offering radical restructuring of the tech sector using, in many cases, historical parallels, thinking about it as comparable to what happened at the beginning of the 20th century when American society was in the previous gilded age, was dominated by new monopolies, in this case of transportation and energy cartels. That familiar idea that if you've got a problem with your democracy, you elect new people to correct for it using the traditional means of getting the vote out. Biden won that contest and in winning that contest, we have to wait and see, but there is some promise that he will use these traditional structures to rectify what has gone wrong over the last decade. And if that is the case, it is not plausible to say that the digital form of democracy comes after the analog form, if the analog form is now needed to correct the digital form. So for all these reasons, there is an arc which has gone into reverse. And yet, and this is what I want to say in the last 10 minutes of my talk, and yet I think we make a mistake to see it in those terms because it's too close to what has become a dominant way of thinking about many of the challenges that we face. And this is true in public discourse and also academic discourse. 
which is to think of these as either or stories, hopes or fears. And what the prime minister said seemed to me exactly right, which is that we have to be open to the ways in which this is always simultaneously both. So I'm often asked the question, because I write a lot about democracy, do I think the digital revolution has been good or bad for democracy? And though I know the answer to very few questions about democracy and the future, I do know the answer to that question. I can always answer that question. The answer has to be both. It has to be that it has been both simultaneously good and bad. And another false binary I think we're too often offered in the 21st century is we're asked to choose whether we're the optimists or the pessimists. This is true of climate change. It's been true throughout the pandemic, the optimistic camp set against the pessimistic camp. And it's certainly true of technology. You are either meant to be hopeful or fearful, but surely the correct thing is to be both. Surely it's to be both. And one reason it should be both is even if those fears that I outlined have come true, I think that those early assumptions have been given the lie to by recent events. It's also true that those early assumptions in many ways still hold. So just because we have learned the compatibility between authoritarian politics and new technology does not mean that this technology is not, at least in some respects, inherently democratic and democratizing. The barriers to entry have been lowered. All sorts of new forms of politics have been tried. On the podcast that I host this week, we've been talking about, um, slightly ugly word, but what's called techno-populism, the coming together of new forms of both technology and technocracy and populist politics. But one of the case studies of that is the Five Star Movement in Italy. Now, lots of different ways of thinking about Five Star, but it's true that Five Star tried in its origin to harness some of the democratizing potential of this technology, not simply to change the way we fight elections, but to change the way we allow citizens to input into policymaking and the creation of political platforms. And there are two things you could say about Five Star. One is that that promise has dissipated because Five Star doesn't do that anymore. The other is to say Five Star is part of the Italian government. A movement that began on that premise is now governing one of the major societies and economies of Europe. And that has to mean something has shifted. And some of the protest politics, the street politics that the prime minister mentioned. Again, we think of street politics, Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, protest politics, people lying down in the road and defying the police to drag them off by force. It looks like the most old fashioned form of politics. And it would be a huge mistake not to recognize that this form of politics is itself now completely intertwined with the digital sphere. To be able to organize, to energize, to create protest politics of which there is much more, much more than there was even a decade ago, is not because we have gone back to street politics, but because street politics themselves are being fueled by the democratizing potential of this technology. And street politics, protest politics, civil disobedience is a form of democracy. And that narrative arc that goes from optimism to pessimism, we've done this once before around the Arab Spring. We saw a, a kind of micro version of it. The initial feeling that these protest movements which overturn governments signaled the democratic potential of this te technology and then the assumption that it had been snuffed out by a reversion to traditional forms of power. It's much more complicated than that and history does not follow a simple narrative arc. Our narratives are almost always illusions that we've overlaid onto the real story. It is not the case that this democratic potential has been snuffed out. It is not the case that democratic politics has failed to adapt. Institutional change has been slow, no question. But it is also the, the case that a lot of politics has, as many people assumed by not adapting, allowed itself to be bypassed by this technology. And a lot of politics happens outside and around the state, not through the state. And I think, and there's much we could say about the pandemic, but if one thinks about this past year and what we have learned, I think we've learned a series of conflicting messages about the relationship between democracy and digital technology. I mean, one message certainly is to go with that more pessimistic view, if you are a Democrat, that some non-democratic regimes, including in China, have shown themselves better able 
to deploy new technologies to deal with something like a pandemic threat, not least because they were unconstrained by some democratic rules and norms. And there will be a lot to be said about the comparative performance of many governments, but many democratic governments have done very well. And democratic governments have done well often in areas which are closely connected to these beneath the surface innovations that have come through this technology. So again, to use a parochial example, my own country, the UK, um, my government, I don't want to call it my government, um, the, the UK government has done badly in many areas. But in some ways it's done well, as other governments have done too. And one of the ways it's done well is by getting help to people who need it. So the scheme that's been adopted in the UK to pay the wages of people who would otherwise be unemployed, part pay those wages. It's been successful, not just because it was in some respects a good idea, but because the technology existed to deliver it that didn't even exist five years ago. A government that had tried to do this five years ago would have found those old fashioned analog tr transmission forms of not just communication, but also transfer unsuited to the task. Many of the reasons why the outcome of the pandemic in social terms, maybe not in health terms, but in social terms hasn't been worse, is because this technology is now all the way through our democratic politics. And we have adapted often without even appreciating it to this new technology. And then related to that, no question through the year of the pandemic, citizens have formed alliances, communities, support networks that have allowed them to get through this year in ways that would not have been possible even say 10 years ago, because so much of what we might think of as citizens connecting with each other does not depend upon conventional organizing institutions. We can do so much more of this for ourselves. So what I would say by way of conclusion is two things really. The first is that I think there is a danger in that idea that we've gone from optimism to pessimism or that history has gone into reverse that we actually mischaracterize what is happening to our democracy. And I think one of the dangers is that there has been in recent years a real emphasis on the idea that in the digital age, our democracies are fragile, that there's a danger that we will fall back into authoritarianism. Often the thought was certainly in recent years that there's a kind of fascism lap, lapping around the edges of this new transformed um, micro-targeting post-truth world. Timothy Snyder, the historian, coined the memorable phrase, post-truth is pre-fascism. I don't think it is. I think it's a mistake to think that we're going back. I don't think we are going back. I'm not saying the direction of travel is that optimistic one. It's always forward to progress. But we are not falling back. We are not reverting to the 1930s or the 1970s. We are still moving ahead, not backwards. And to think that we're moving backwards, I think, is a mistake. And it's a mistake we fall into too easily. Our democracies are not fragile. Our democracies have shown that actually they have survived what was thought would sweep them away, this new technology. If anything, our democracies are not fragile, they're frozen, they're stuck. And because we cling onto them, because we think if we tinker with them, the authoritarians will win, we hold on to these forms, hold them in place in ways that actually we should be opening up. And the last thing I'll say is because the answer to the question is not either or, but both, we don't often enough say that if we are going to democratize the digital, the thing that we use to democratize the digital needs itself to be opened up. So if Facebook or some other social network is going to use its extraordinary network reach to bring people together and to say that it is an inherent force for democratic good, it needs to democratize internally. If Mark Zuckerberg is gonna save the world, he also needs to be open to the world pushing back against being saved by him. If Joe Biden's administration is gonna break up the big technology corporations, if it's gonna adopt, a, I don't suppose it will, a radical agenda, put workers on the boards, democratize the internal institutions, open up cartels of power, it needs to open itself up. Too often how this comes out is the instrument we will use to democratize the thing we think has been captured is an instrument we don't dare democratize because we think if we democratized it, it wouldn't be useful for our purposes. That's our mistake. We need to democratize, including digitally democratize, the institutions that we are using to re-democratize the digital. So my answer to the question that I posed in the title of this talk, digitize democracy, or democratize the digital 
is, and this is the one thing I'm clear about, I can't tell you certainly not in half an hour exactly how to do it, but the one thing I am absolutely clear about is that the answer to that question is we have to do both. Thank you. I wish I could uh, ask the couple of hundred or so participants in this conference to uh, join me in thanking David Ransiman by giving him an applause. But since I have only about five people in front of me in this auditorium, I won't do that. But I'm sure we are all uh, grateful for his uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so let me just thank him on behalf of, of ETA. Um, the next speaker we have today is Mireille Hildebrandt. Uh, she is a research professor of interfacing law and technologies at Freie Universität Brussels. She is also a co-director of a research group on law, science, technology, and society studies, and also holds an appointment as a professor of smart environments, data protection, and the rule of law at Radboud University in the Netherlands. So please, uh, Mirel, Mireille Hildebrandt. My last sip of water, thank you very much um, for giving me the floor here uh, at this extremely interesting conference with extremely interesting, important questions. And I decided to title um, my talk, Is Democracy Computable or Is It? Did you know what is a nocebo effect? It means that you suffer side effects of medication. Only you don't. So here there is an article <clears throat> that reviews the theoretical and biological understanding of both the nocebo and placebo phenomena. Um, basically it means, uh, uh, nocebo means that uh, you are given a medicine and you've heard about potential side effects. And because you fear those side effects, you get adverse effects that you attribute to, to this um, uh, medication. It's, so it's very similar to the placebo, which does the inverse. You could say, um, <clears throat> you could ask the question whether you may develop side effects of a vaccine that you fear whether you may actually develop the intended effects of a vaccine, though you got a placebo. Um, the latter would be great, of course, especially if we would have some control over that, but it has definitely not been established. Um, but the interesting thing is that both a placebo and a nocebo um, may influence actually also your immune system. And what this article scientific paper does is look at how that works at the level of the brains um, and the body. So um, for a long time, people thought that placebo was something between your ears in a figurative sense. And it was people imagining things or trying to uh, get away from work by pretending to be ill, for instance. And then at some point it became evident that the relationship between people's expectations and anticipations and the brain and the body is much more complex than that. Both of the effects, placebo and nocebo, demonstrate the performative effects of these expectations and anticipation. And the interesting thing is that that um, effect can now be measured at the level of the brain and the body. Now, this is interesting because why should I start with, um, with this sort of um, talk? Well, that's because I want to move the discussion on democracy towards behaviorism. And I want to um, uh, talk about this idea that things that you expect or anticipate may actually come true. There is a longstanding tradition uh, for instance, uh, in the work of uh, Robert Merton, who uh, is a philosopher of science and wrote a very long time ago, 
about what he considered the so-called self-fulfilling prophecy based on a theorem of Thomas and Thomas beginning last century, uh, where they said if men, this was beginning last century, let's say if human beings define a situation as real, it is real in its consequences. Um, Merton used that in a pejorative sense. Um, uh, if people start to believe fake news, uh, the fake news may create its own dynamic and may actually become true. But you could also say that this is inherent in human society to create expectations that uh, have a life of their own. And you could even say that the whole of the law depends on such expectations consolidating and becoming true. If you, for instance, look at the performative effect of what people call uh, speech acts, what scholars uh, call speech acts, if there is a civil servant who stands in front of two people who want to be married and have gone through a whole lot of <clears throat> um, uh, bureaucratic uh, stuff, and that civil servant tells them, I declare you husband and husband or wife and wife or husband and wife, then at that moment when that civil servant writes that down, registers it in the public register, in the public civil register, So this was a little trick of the uh, normative effect of technology when it doesn't work, but we immediately go back to sharing the screen and here we are. Um, so if we all believe that people are married, if all these conditions have been met and if, this, if it is uh, <clears throat> inscribed in the registry, then it actually becomes true. So there is a, a very specific type of normative force in what we do um, that is not really causal. This is a very important uh, thing to, to understand. Now, when I talk about the biological substrate of speech acts, I'm not talking about biological causation. It's not that the civil servant has now caused the marriage or that somebody's brain has caused that marriage. It's a little bit more complex than that. So it doesn't depend on what I will explain soon, a behaviorist understanding. Though the article, the paper that I was just referencing, um, views these sort of effects in terms of a learning paradigm. Basically the paper says your brains are learning because you're afraid that this may be dangerous so your brains begin to anticipate and they learn that you're going to have pain which you're then actually going to have. Actually, I would say that this biological substrate confirms the inactive nature of action and perception. That means that your perception is basically always an anticipation of what sort of action you could make. I want to move from this statement from Robert Merton, if men define a situation as real, it is real in its consequences, which also goes for women these days, um, to a famous statement, a seminal statement of Hannah Arendt at the end of her uh, human condition, where she says, I'm not afraid that behaviorism is true, but that it will become true. And I want to follow that up saying that I'm not afraid that democracy is computable, but I am afraid that it might become computable. Now, why should we be concerned about that? 
Well, first of all, it is clear that what matters, the things that we care about, can always be computed in one way or another. That means in different ways. And it's important to see that democracy is not just a decision mechanism, but would then become a discussion about which computation of what matters would be the right one or the better one. <clears throat> Let's take a quick dive into democratic theory and democratic practice. So um, like um, David Ruckerman was uh, discussing in the previous talk, we have this thing theory, but also the practice that's called representative democracy. So one person, one vote. I would say that's built on the idea that a government should have equal respect and concern for each individual citizen. It owes that. Of course, that's easily translated into thinking in terms of counting votes, uh, thinking in terms of an aggregate majority that rules. And this is also as I said, based on this equal respect. So this is an important um, root of the kind of democracy that we have now. Of course, that's one part of doing democracy. And it's also one type of uh, democratic theory. The other one is deliberative democracy, uh, which basically believes that after all the voting is done, what matters is a parliament that listens to what's happening in the public sphere in civil society and then deliberates on decisions to find a better argument. And this is based generally on the idea with, that we should reach uh, a rational consensus here. Uh, um, now, it should be clear that uh, rational consensus is perhaps uh, very often an illusion and that the problem of democracy, but also what makes democracy so interesting is that we may never come to agree. And sometimes we may not even share each other's assumption and uh, may not come together. So from this deliberative democracy, that's uh, some people would say is a little bit romantic about what sort of consensus could be reached. We need something called participatory democracy that highlights the potential of conflict, not only in a negative sense, but it also highlights that making sure that you hear all the voices, that you have agonism in your debate, that you listen to contradictory arguments and conclude that they cannot come together, but still life goes on, we have to make decisions which means that we need compromise and mutual respect between people who are willing to agree to disagree, but still to go on with decision-making. And there's a lot of work done that shows that if this agonism becomes productive, if people do listen to each other, that makes for much more robust decision-making. Now let's, um, all this is based on, uh, let's say 20th century's ideas about democracy. Let's move forward and try to imagine what could be computational democracy. Are we talking about a voting algorithm uh, that, uh, that somehow decides based on people's preferences uh, what they're going to vote for so that they don't have to vote anymore? That's actually the last of the three mentioned here. Do we need a voting algorithm that based on aggregate preferences uh, via very complex uh, mathematics decides whether this was a fair um, election and, and what that results in? Or are we, for, uh, for instance, thinking in terms of reasoning algorithms? Uh, so trying to, to transform the argumentation in the deliberation into logical statements and then making a decision tree and coming out with the solution. Might you think that uh, com the computability of democracy is some sort of science fiction? No, this is something that people seriously write about. And um, uh, here it, there is a paper in the title referring to the augmentation of democracy. You can feel the, the tech savingness of this uh, title, considering whether technology could enhance concept of democracy. 
for what the author Peter Burgess uh, actually proposes is um, a simple transfer of uh, voting for representatives online. So this is something we already have. Um, uh, and there is a lot of uh, security issues around that, but it's not very uh, complicated to understand what it's about. The next idea is a bit more revolutionary. So it's the idea that people can directly online vote for specific uh, bills or legislature <clears throat> that have been proposed in the normal uh, in-person legislature. The, the third thing is what I referred to in the previous slide. So the idea that since we have big data, we can mine what people are actually doing and infer from that which are their preferences and then have the knowledge that is mined from that directly inform uh, the legislature. Uh, of course, obviously, the last idea is to completely replace the legislature um, and all the individuals, persons in it with a legislature composed of algorithms representing the voting public. So you could say this is the singularity of uh, democracy. Now you might say, oh, this is all nonsense. It's never going to happen. Or you might say, oh, it might happen tomorrow. But let's look at what's happening today. We have the introduction of rules as code and smart regulation um, in various jurisdictions coming very close to actually being implemented. That means translating the rules of statutes into code and attributing to that code the force of law. Um, propositions to derive a kind of personalized computational law, uh, inferring all the situations and circumstances of a particular person that has a legal problem, and then personalizing the, legislating, legislate, the legislation, the statutes, the case law towards that situation, meaning that everybody will get there what the Germans used to call a century ago, Einzelfallgerechtigkeit by algorithm. At this moment already, legal search informs uh, the search that uh, big law and many courts um, <clears throat> use. So they use intelligent software systems uh, to determine how to prepare for their uh, case. As we all know, there's a lot of automated decision-making and fraud detection and welfare benefits decisions in public administration. Uh, and we have the disruption of the information ecosystem in the public sphere that grounds um, democracy uh, by way, so this disruption by way of uh, behavioral targeting. Um, and all this is based on a kind of idea that we see very clearly in the data strategy of the European Commission, this idea that if we would just have access to more data, everything would be better, even the law, and perhaps even democracy. Um, I'm going to, um, to talk a little bit about the history of behaviorism, picking up from a famous um, theorem by uh, Arrow. Arrow uh, did an investigation, uh, economic and mathematical investigation into uh, what would be a fair election. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, keep your eye on the cartoon on the right-hand side. But the problem was that um, when he started trying to calculate what would be a fair uh, election, a fair way to count votes and to make decisions based on those votes, that any time you had more than two people voting and more than three choices for these people, that the outcome would either be impossible, it is a paradox, or that the only outcome that was not a paradox would be a dictator, that is one person who decides everything. Um, this uh, was not a new thing. It basically goes back to um, what was done in, in the, what was pioneered in the 18th century. Um, and what has grown in the course of the 20th century into uh, 
social choice theory. Here on the left side, you see the uh, beginning of the entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on social choice theory. So the idea is that you could calculate the right decision based on aggregate preferences. And this whole idea, both uh, social choice theory and behaviorism itself that underlies it, often align with some form of utilitarianism. There's a particular understanding of ethics. Um, and it all seems to re reduce voting behaviors because that then becomes the term to consumer preference. You like red wine, I like white wine. You prefer Republicans, I prefer Democrats. I want to briefly check into the history of social choice theory and behaviorism. The uh, founding father of behaviorism uh, is uh, Pavlov, uh, who did experiments with dogs. Keep your eye on the, or on the cartoon. The cartoon basically inverses who is trying to manipulate who here. Um, basically, Pavlov developed the so-called stimulus reflex theory where he tried to prove in a laboratory that animals like dogs do not only have innate behavior, um, native behavior, but that they learn. And he tried to prove that by treating the animal as a manipulable mechanism. And this is all based on what has been called methodological atomism, seeing not only animals as completely decontextualized from their environment, their natural environment, <clears throat> but trying to discretize behavior into, into chips, into discrete elements. There was a whole methodological struggle, uh, especially uh, in economic science. There were actually uh, more than one struggle that returned several times the last century. And this Methodenstreit, as it was called in, in German, is extremely relevant because as you can imagine, by cutting up behavior into discrete um, uh, uh, pieces and sequences, you're sort of catering to the computer because this is what a computer loves. This is what a computer can work with. Let's have a look at what one of the other big men of um, behaviorism said. This is Watson in 1930. The interest of the behaviorist is in man's doings more than the interest of a spectator. He wants to control man's reactions, just like physical scientists want to control and manipulate other natural phenomena. So here you see that just like in the natural sciences, the idea was once we know how people work, then we can start controlling them. And we can move on towards Skinner, but also to social physics, Pentland, Helbing, and in the end, uh, Sunstein. Um, the second person that I want to discuss and, and, and his influence is Herbert Simon, uh, one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence, um, who said, uh, for instance, to design, to design is to devise courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Who would be against that? Um, Herbert Simon is especially interesting because he wrote a famous article about why should machines learn in 1986. He was actually very skeptical in that article. He said, why should you let machines go to the whole process of learning something if you already know how it should be done? Uh, with the hype in machine learning, people have sort of laughed at this understanding of Herbert Simon and said, well, that's because he didn't have the right technology, he didn't have access to the data, but you can now see this position move back into focus in a controversy between, for instance, Gary Marcus and Jan LeCun about the extent to which we need prior knowledge in these systems. Uh, Simon also invented the idea of bounded rationality. Um, as we all know, uh, Kahneman and Tver Tversky, two psychologists, cognitive psychologists who won the Nobel Prize for economics, uh, took this idea of bounded rationality, developed the idea of cognitive bias, where again, if you, if you believe in this bias and you can find it and pinpoint it, 
you can use these biases to manipulate people. Um, now, why is all this relevant? Well, look here, this is an existing website. I picked it up a couple of days ago. This is a website of uh, Cambridge University, the Psychometric Center. Uh, it refers to the My Personality database. Um, that was the famous database that was used by um, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, psychometric means that you try to find these discrete elements of human behavior. Uh, let's say that Facebook was built to enable this. Uh, here we have the numbers. So the database is filled with data of 6 million volunteers. Um, uh, and I could say a lot about this, what could possibly go wrong if you use this sort of data to manipulate, for instance, elections, uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, we all know the history. So they base themselves on this particular database. Now, Cambridge Analytica is about the willful manipulation of voters. Whether they actually manage to manipulate voters, I doubt. I do think they very seriously disrupted elections and destroyed disrupted the public sphere. Um, interestingly, Sandstein, uh, who is definitely a social choice uh, person, uh, wrote uh, in 2007, republic.com, where he basically warns against this. However, in 2008, one year later, he wrote together with Tyler the book Nudge. And the book Nudge is about how to nudge, manipulate, people into preferred behavior. Um, it's also good to point out that one of the founding fathers of what some people like to call neoliberal economy is James Buchanan, who got the Nobel Prize um, and who uh, is the founding father of public choice theory. So, so the application of social choice theory for uh, let's say uh, democratic decision-making. I. Uh, see that uh, uh, my time is limited. I'm going to move a bit forward. I'm going to, of course, share the, uh, uh, the PowerPoints, but I'm going to move forward. I'm going to go uh, move forward by moving back to Hannah Arendt. Uh, she said, I'm not afraid that behaviorism is true, but it will become true. She also said, the world lies between people. Interest, which has different meanings, comes from inter esse, being in between. So interest, people's interest, lies in between people. Uh, that means there is more than these discrete behaviors. Um, and uh, there, there is wonderful work. Once again, I'm going to move a bit quicker into this. Uh, there's wonderful work on how you could use design of these machine learning systems, of the interfaces, uh, the back end and the front end systems to inform uh, democracy. <clears throat> Another wonderful slide that we don't have time for. Let's go back last uh, series of slides and, and see whether democracy is computable. The first thing that I said, and I'm going to repeat it here, anything is computable, but it's always computable in different ways. So if we make democracy computable, it would mean that the deliberation that is core, the participation that is core to democracy will be displaced. First of all, the question would have to be answered every time which computation would be an adequate translation or proxy of what we want. Second, we would have to begin to have to ask questions like what big players have the expertise to offer such translation and what big players would have to the power to actually decide on those proxies. Last slide, I am not sure that we want to displace democracy from talking about choices that we can easily understand 
because they are articulated in natural language. Um, two choices where we first have to go through this cumbersome process of deciding what computational proxy can be used for something that we would otherwise um, discuss in normal language. Um, and I'm sure that the next speaker is going to give us a lot of uh, extra input on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mireille, for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a question, several questions about that in the panel afterwards. But now we are going to take a, a 20 minutes break before our final speaker, uh, Shoshana Zubov, uh, talks.
So, welcome back. Um, uh, our, our last speaker uh, before uh, our panel at the end of the session is uh, Shoshana Zuboff. Um, she is a scholar, writer, and an activist who has, as she puts it herself, spent the last 43 years studying the rise of the digital as a political economic force propelling our transformation into an information civilization. Her most recent work is The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, Susanna, Susanna Zuboff is Ch uh, Charles Edward Wilson, Professor Emerita at Harvard Business School. And Susanna, please. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I look forward to the time when we can all be sitting together in that beautiful hall. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited uh, for a future invitation to be able to be there in person. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it always fascinates me that um, at least according to many accounts, it was a British data scientist by the name of Clive Humby, who in the year 2006, first declared that data is the new oil. And he did this while he was working for the British uh, retail giant Tesco on a data-based customer loyalty program. The satisfying symmetry of the phrase made it travel fast. It offered a playful nod to the distinct hallmarks of wealth creation in two centuries, but also a sharp warning. Data will define our epoch for better or worse. 15 years later, the profound truth of Humby's statement stands as the summary of my generation's destructive legacy. Oil was extracted from the earth and in the absence of public comprehension and law, its uncontrolled use plunged our earthly home into irreversible peril. Data are extracted from humanity. And in the absence of public comprehension and law, their uncontrolled use threatens to change our societies, transform us through another breed of destruction. Of course, our, ne our nemesis has never been oil or data, but the extractors themselves. In both industries, corporate institutions concealed their own scientists' research on the harms of their products, conducted and enabled global campaigns of disinformation, and placed their economic self-interest above all bonds of fealty, above your family, and above mine. And in both cases, the trail of catastrophic destruction has been treated as an externality for which corporations are not held to account or forced to change. In our century, the massive scale extraction of human generated data has produced the most powerful corporations of the modern era. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, it's a mixed case, but here I'm naming only the largest. And of course I include their far reaching ecosystems companies large and small. In these institutions pioneered a dark and startling twist on 21st century economics of extraction. Instead of blameless wilderness, human nature is now the target. I've called this new economic logic surveillance capitalism because it maintains key elements of traditional capitalism, such as private property, market exchange, growth, profit. But these cannot be realized without the technologies and social relations of surveillance. Hidden methods of observation and data capture are designed to unilaterally dispossess individuals of what had until now been considered private experience. So this is how it works. Surveillance capitalists claim our lives as free raw material 
for translation into behavioral data. They then claim those data as their private property available for manufacture and sales. Extraction operations are engineered as undetectable and aim at rich predictive signals, the stoop of your shoulders, the cadence of your speech, facial micro expressions. These signals are produced outside of our awareness and therefore beyond our choice to give or conceal. Here's an example. An Amazon press release rec recently boasted, base analysis generates metadata about detected faces in the form of gender, age range, emotions, attributes such as smile, face pose, face image quality, and face landmarks. Now, improvements to Amazon's recognition system mean that it can add fear to the range of emotions already detected. Happy, sad, angry, surprised, disgusted, calm, and confused. But here's the thing. I do not choose to give Amazon my fear. It's not simply that my feelings are not for sale. It's that my feelings are unsaleable because they are inalienable. At least during most of the modern age, citizens, especially of democratic societies, have regarded personal experience this way as inalienable. But today, even though I do not grant Amazon knowledge of my fear, they take it from me anyway. These methods of surveillance profiteering violate individual sovereignty and rob their targets of decision rights, including the right to choose privacy and the right to combat and contest the nullification of this right to decide. Personal information is the stolen treasure. Surveillance is the getaway car. And the entire economic edifice of surveillance capitalism is built on this illegitimate bed of sand. Data travel through complex supply chains from computers, smartphones, smart devices, sensors, cameras, apps, cars, homes, bodies, cities, schools, shops, and more. They merge in computational factories where they are fabricated into behavioral predictions. These computational products are sold to business customers. They come from us, but they are not for us. They trade in a new kind of marketplace that operates exclusively in this predictive knowledge, reaping huge rewards for surveillance profiteering. These are commodity markets where human futures are sold and purchased just like pork or wheat or oil. Surveillance capitalism was invented at Google, migrated to Facebook, became the default logic for the tech sector, and now travels through nearly every economic sector. Indeed, a data scientist whom I was recently interviewing summed it up to me this way, quote, the underlying norm of virtually all software and application design now is data collection. All software design assumes that all data should be collected. Surveillance capitalists sell certainty. The better their predictions, the greater their profits. But when profits depend on making human behavior more predictable, economic imperatives unleash a series of profoundly anti-democratic consequences in the same way that burning fossil fuel releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and unleashes global warming. The competition in prediction relies on the scale and scope of data. And this means that 
extraction must be pursued at unimaginable scale. This is why we feel that water level of these incursions rising relentlessly and ever more audaciously with each passing year. In 2018, a leaked Facebook document describes its AI backbone, which is its computational factory, as ingesting trillions of data points every day to produce 6 million behavioral predictions each second. These immense concentrations of knowledge immediately translate into a novel form of power whose aim is to widen the attack surface for extraction and improve the validity of predictions. I call this instrumentarian power because it works its will through the medium of digital instrumentation. For example, personal information is exploited for the production of targeting mechanisms that are aimed not only to extract data, but now to actually uh, tune, herd, manipulate, and modify behavior itself. These mechanisms include things like subliminal cues, engineered social comparison dynamics, psychological micro-targeting, recommendation tools, real-time rewards and punishments, gamification, among others. And these are designed to proactively actuate behavior and attitudes in ways that increase extraction and enhance prediction. In other words, these systems are engineered to ceaselessly escalate the scale of engagement in order to maximize extraction and prediction. But for the sake of scale, they are and must be in a formal sense, absolutely indifferent to what engages us. As you heard in the introduction, I've spent the last 43 years studying the rise of the digital as a political economic force, driving this transformation into an information civilization. And over these last two decades, I've observed the once young internet companies morph into surveillance empires. These corporations now vie with democracy over the principles and moral content of our social order. On the strength of their surveillance capabilities and for the sake of their surveillance profits, their unimpeded orgy of extraction has enabled what I call a fundamentally anti-democratic epistemic coup. Epistemic means all things related to knowledge and knowing. And this coup is a revolutionary takeover of what is known, who can know it, and to what purpose. In an information civilization, societies are defined by questions of knowledge, how it is distributed, the authority that governs its distribution, and the power that protects that authority. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Who decides who decides who knows? Knowledge, authority, and power. The problem is that surveillance capitalists now hold the answers to each question, though we never elected them to govern. This is the essence of the epistemic coup. It proceeds in four stages. The first, as we've already begun to talk about, is the illegitimate appropriation of knowledge captured in secret from private territory that has been until now considered inalienable. In other words, the elemental rights, the pre-political rights to know and to control knowledge of one's own personal experience. And this is what I've called epistemic rights. These are taken from people and accumulated as corporate rights. Surveillance capitalists claim the authority to decide who knows, 
by asserting ownership over our personal information. This rights grab lays the foundation for all that follows. The second stage, not surprisingly, is marked by a sharp rise in epistemic inequality, defined as the difference between what I can know and what can be known about me. And the third stage, which we are living through now, introduces epistemic chaos as the byproduct of the imperative to extract at scale and scope. Here, a range of targeting mechanisms that we've talked about aim to increase engagement as a means to extraction and predictability, create institutional conditions where the most inflammatory content and the most corrupt information, most of it produced by coordinated schemes of disinformation, are privileged as force multipliers of extraction accessorized with a range of targeting algorithms and vaulted to the center stage of social discourse. The bare bones of the truth here is that the more inflammatory and corrupt the content, the greater engagement it draws, the greater the attack surface for engagement and extraction, and therefore, the greater the scale and scope and the greater the prediction. All of these elemental imperatives are linked. The effects of profit-driven algorithmic amplification and disinformation and dis and dis uh, emanation, excuse me, and the micro-targeting of corrupt content are felt in the real world where they splinter shared reality, poison social discourse, paralyze democratic politics, instigate violence, and sometimes even death. The problem is that the companies know this, at least since 2016, maybe earlier. Facebook certainly has known from its own research the causal links between its algorithmic targeting mechanisms and the rise of extremist far-right groups. And they've also known that their algorithms were super spreading the toxic content of hyperpartisan, hyperactive sources of disinformation simply by automatically rewarding engagement, including COVID-19 disinformation. So dramatic was the spread of virus-related disinformation, in fact, that it accounts for mass death in my country, the United States, according to the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University, a study that was published in October 2020, at a time when there were 217,000 COVID deaths in the United States, the center estimated that at least 130,000 of those deaths, and possibly as many as 200,000 were unnecessary deaths, avoidable deaths. And when they looked at the four most important reasons for these deaths, each one of them, when you inspect the details, revert back to the dynamics of epistemic chaos. Things like the failure to mandate face masks and the politi politicization of information. All of these reflect the central role of this orgy of epistemic chaos and its tragic proportions. The world turned to social media, places like Facebook, in search of information health, safety. Instead, we entered a political in economic institution defined by lethal strategies of epistemic chaos for profit. In the year 1966, two extraordinary scholars, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, 
wrote a short book of lasting importance, The Social Construction of Reality. And its central observation is that all societies are constructions in the face of chaos. The ongoing miracle of social order that keeps chaos at bay rests on what they call common sense, common sense knowledge. And that means the knowledge that we share with others in the normal, self-evident routines of everyday life. This everyday life is what we experience as reality, but its existence depends upon our active and perpetual shared construction, our shared creation of order together. Society renews itself as common sense evolves. For example, the idea of democracy was at one time a deviation from the norm that became a force for renewal. But not all deviations are sources of renewal. Many of them are destructive and regressive and they belong at the fringe. They belong at the fringe of society. And what is normal is what occupies the center. As a democratic people, we need to be able to distinguish between deviations that advance or threaten our fundamental democratic values and aspirations. This requires trustworthy, transpa transparent, respectful institutions of social discourse, especially when we disagree. Instead, we find ourselves saddled with the opposite, nearly 20 years into a world dominated by an institution that has rooted and flourished and that operates as a chaos machine for hire. Surveillance capitalism is an institution in which norm violating content is good for business. In my country, those who hold freedom of speech as a sacred right often look to a 1919 dissenting opinion of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And we look to it as a touchstone because he argued that according to the American constitution, the ultimate societal good is best reached, quote, by free trade in ideas. The best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. The idea is a free, and fair public square. The problem now is that surveillance capitalism's anti-social media is not a public square. It's a private square governed by machine operations, thickly, densely populated by its economic imperatives and operational mechanisms incapable of and formally disinterested in distinguishing truth from lies or renewal from destruction. The corrupt information that dominates this private square does not rise to the top of a free and free, uh, fair competition of ideas. On the contrary, corruption is prized. It furthers the aims of engagement, extraction, and prediction, and is thus fixed at the center, at the center stage of social discourse. It's a rigged game where the house always wins and no democracy can survive this game. Finally, the fourth stage, epistemic dominance. I'll mention this only briefly, and perhaps we'll have a chance in our panel discussion to talk about this a little bit more. Epistemic chaos, as you can imagine, prepares the ground for dominance by weakening democratic society. All too plain in my country in the insurrection on Capitol Hill in January. This is the stage where we see the surveillance empires defending their self-asserted authority of Dana ownership with their absolute power to control critical information systems and infrastructures. 
epistemic dominance, dominance is institutionalized, overriding democratic governance with computational governance. The machines know, the systems decide, directed and sustained by the illegitimate authority and anti-democratic power of private surveillance capital as it has asserted authority through private ownership of all human generated data. This final stage is already evident. You don't need binoculars to see it. There are many examples of it. I'll mention just a couple. You know, European governments at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic experienced what I regard as a particularly consequential signal of epistemic dominance. When Apple and Google refused to modify their exposure notification protocol and their operating systems to accommodate European public health authorities and their own applications for epidemiologically useful notification and tracing, displacing the authority of democratically elected officials and democratic governance with their own absolute control over critical infrastructure. There are many other examples, including Facebook's illegitimate and, to, in my view, audacious effort to extend the life of its self-regulating ideology with its so-called Facebook Oversight Board, or Google and Facebook's demonstration of their willingness, and in Facebook's case, its actual action <laughs> to turn off their systems rather than negotiate with the Australian government. And of course, the companies won. When it comes to the ultimate targets of this coup, the targets are democracy itself. Let the word go out to elected leaders, secretaries, ministers, and civil servants of every liberal democracy. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Finally, capitalism in the digital age could have taken many forms. Why is it that an extractive and anti-democratic surveillance economics is winning this race so far? There are many reasons, of course, but chief among them is that democracy has not yet intervened to stop it. The world's liberal democracies have thus far failed to construct co a coherent political vision of a digital century that advances democratic values, principles, and government. The result is a young information civilization that has not yet found its footing in democracy. This failure becomes even more significant in the geopolitical context, where we see how, how much the Chinese have exerted effort and intentionality in the design and employment of digital technologies that advance their own system of authoritarian rule. Indeed, just today, we're seeing headlines that the Chinese government is considering taking over the databases of their large tech companies. Their strategies are central to their domestic and foreign policy, whereas the West's failure to claim the nexus of technology and democracy for its own purpose has left a void that was quickly filled by surveillance capitalism as private systems of surveillance and behavioral control rooted and flourished outside the rule of law and democratic governance. So as we enter this third decade of our digital century, the world's democracies have a choice to make as consequential for our societies as the choice to confront global warming is for our earth. Surveillance capitalism or democracy. We cannot outlaw global warming, but we can interrupt and outlaw surveillance capitalism and reclaim the promise of a joyful, flourishing, prosperous democratic digital century 
anything that can be made by people can be unmade. Nothing is inevitable. We enter the third decade of the digital century without the charters of rights, legislative frameworks, and governmental institutions that will be required for a digital and democratic future. So in closing, I'll simply name three principles for this crucial decade. The first is that the digital must live in democracy's house, not as an arsonist, but as a member of the family, subject to and thriving on its laws and values. The second is that we live in a time where our material conditions, the development of our civilization, means that we finally need new rights. The rights that have protected us until this moment in our history will no longer be adequate going forward. We are going to have to outline new rights for ourselves, beginning with new epistemic rights. These will have to be crystallized in response to our changing conditions. And that crystallization means traveling the arc from elemental pre-political rights to rights that are codified in law. And if we do not achieve these new juridical rights in, this, in the coming decade, my fear is that these inalienable dimensions of our experience, once taken for granted, will be lost to us forever. forever. They must be codified in law and protected if they are to exist at all. Finally, unprecedented harms require unprecedented solutions. Just as the conditions of life reveal the need for new rights, the new harms mean that we are going to have to purpose build solutions to interrupt and outlaw surveillance capitalism and its unprecedented mechanisms and imperatives. Democracy is under the kind of siege that only democracy can end. Only democracy has the countervailing power to put us back on track to a digital future in which our values and inspirations can flourish. Thank you so much. So let me, on behalf of the organizers of the conference, thank Shoshana Zuboff very much for this most provocating talk. We are now going to move uh, straight to uh, a panel with the participation of our three speakers, uh, David Ransiman, uh, Mireille Hildebrandt, and Shoshana Zuboff. Uh, Katrin Jakobsdóttir is also going to participate, but um, our understanding is that she is uh, stuck in a ministerial meeting, and given the, the recent uh, outburst in uh, infections here in Iceland, uh, we will have to see whether she manages to, to join us. But uh, in addition to those four uh, speakers, we have here um, Maximilian Konrad, who is professor uh, of political science and uh, faculty head uh, at the University of Iceland. His uh, research interests include European integration, German, po German politics, and, and political theory. He is also a coordinator for the Jean Monnet Network Post Truth Politics, Nationalism, and the Delegitimation of European Integration. And uh, also, uh, we are joined by Sveit Johansson, who is a Fennel Early Career Research Fellow in United States History at the, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so, we will, uh, we will start. Um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down here and I want to... Well, uh, let me just say first what's, what strikes me a little bit. 
listening to these three talks is uh, um, the dark uh, tone, if you can say that a tone is dark, or the dark sort of um, sound. Um, uh, the uh, Professor Hildebrandt uh, actually referred to a very well-known book uh, uh, called Thinkers or Men in Dark Times when she was talking about Hannah Arendt. So you, <coughs> you, you can't help the feeling that uh, we are faced uh, today more by threats when we talk about democracy and, and the digital, um, our digital reality than by uh, inspiration or hope. Um, so maybe I'll just throw that out as a comment. Uh, I don't know if you want to pick up something similar, but I wanted to ask you, Sved, to, to start. If you would like to make a comment on the talk so far and perhaps ask a question to one or all of the speakers. Yes, thanks, uh, Jon. I don't know if my comments last question will do much to uh, alleviate your concerns about the darkness, uh, darkness factor, but I wanted to pick up on some of the points that have been made in these talks today about uh, the geopolitical context and um, the institutional structures of power within which many of these new technologies um, have been developed. As Professor Supov has pointed out in her work, much of the uh, technological development we're talking about here today um, has taken place institutionally within a military informational or a military digital state of exception. That is, within surveillance corporations, as well as the surveillance state or the surveillance states that have been largely exempted from democratic oversight and legal control. Um, these black boxes are in turn uh, intimately connected with national security imperatives and international competition. Technological development has you know, become a matter of military and economic survival of nations. And technology has in no small measure been transformed into a matter of national security, securitized, which then also serves as a pretext for concentrating and centralizing power and exempting it more and more from democratic debate and constitutional rules. So my question um, was maybe that, um, what I'm wondering is whether it's possible to deal with a digital problem without dealing with the state problem or the security state problem that actually preceded it, um, as well as the greater problem of international power politics more generally. Great technological changes have often been accompanied by new visions of international order, nuclear energy, um, and the visions for the international control of atomic, um, atomic energy is, is one example. So I was wondering what do you think democracy in the digital age needs new forms of international control and cooperation? Thank you. So, I, so before I ask you to respond, I'll maybe ask you, uh, Max, to do the same. Okay, great. Well, thank you, first of all, for, uh, for inviting me to this event. And thank you for three very, very thought-provoking uh, presentations that I enjoyed a lot. Um, and I mean, many of them touch on things that I'm dealing with in my work. Um, and I, I mean, to some extent, I, I share Jon's assessment here that there's a kind of a dark tone in the presentations. And when I was listening, I mean, to the first presentation, I couldn't, I couldn't help noting down, I mean, that there's a, I mean, when you talked about the anarchic nature of the internet and that that doesn't necessarily have kind of an, in, an inherent demo, dem, uh, democratizing potential. I, I couldn't help thinking that, that, you know, that sounds a lot like, like Thomas Hobbes. I mean, uh, that, I mean, in, uh, in a state of, uh, of anarchy, I mean, uh, not all is necessarily well. Um, about the, uh, the point that the presentations had a, a relatively dark tone, I thought it was actually quite interesting that I mean, there was quite a bit of variation between the presentations. And um, I thought in the first one, obviously, the, uh, I mean, the claim was also made that, I mean, that uh, we shouldn't necessarily be pessimistic. I mean, that there is a certain kind of optimism that we can also, uh, you know, advance when we're looking at the role of, uh, of the Internet in, uh, in democracy. Uh, however, what I found very interesting about this presentation was that, I mean, th th there seems to be a tendency in the, in the social sciences to, uh, for some reason, be forced into 
uh, I mean, what David, David Ronsiman here described as, as these false binaries. I mean, uh, that you're either supposed to be optimistic or pessimistic about the role of the internet. Um, and I think that's quite interesting because, I mean, I completely share the view that, I mean, this is not something that necessarily has to be the case. And I completely share the assessment that, I mean, yes, there is reason for pessimism, but there is also reason for optimism. Uh, and I'm saying that primarily as somebody who's uh, studying post-truth politics, and that's something that also came up quite prominently in the presentation, um, where, I mean, where David Runciman um, specifically pointed to the, uh, I mean, to the, uh, to the idea that uh, Timothy Snyder put out there that post-truth is pre-fascism, uh, something you, that, that you don't share, uh, I mean, this view. But I think there is still something to be, to be said about this. I mean, this idea that it's, it's this either or that we tend to, uh, tend to be forced into, because I think this is something that is also quite characteristic about the whole debate about post-truth politics, um, where, I mean, you're basically forced to choose sides. I mean, is it something that is a fundamental challenge to democracy or is it not? Is it new? Is it more severe than anything that we've ever seen before? Uh, and I think those discussions kind of lead in the wrong direction. I mean, they lead away from the very real challenge that, that post-truth politics um, actually constitutes. And I think that that's a problem that has um, a lot of, in a sense, facets that I guess we're going to talk about uh, in this, uh, this uh, roundtable discussion, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, but I mean, one of the things that strikes me and that you know, also connects to this idea of this dark tone in these presentations is, I mean, if we think, if we think about uh, Timothy, uh, Timothy Snyder saying that, you know, post-truth is pre-fascism, uh, it's kind of very hard to, uh, to say, well, you know, that's just simply not the case and it's as simple as that. I mean, uh, when I look at the events on January 6th on Capitol Hill, it's very hard to, uh, to not draw that conclusion that, I mean, this is something that has to do with the kind of disinformation that is spread via social media, or other, other forms um, uh, on the internet, and that has an impact on the way people behave. And, and I mean, obviously the, the people that um, stormed the capital on that day, I mean, they were not necessarily the most democratic type. So I think uh, there is something to be said about this. Um, but of course, I mean, with all that, I want to say that, I mean, these, these false binaries are always problematic. Um, and I, I don't think that we need to in a sense, determine whether something is, is more profound of a challenge than anything that we've ever witnessed before in order to be able to say that it is a fundamental challenge and it is something that has to be dealt with. And I think that's what we're probably going, uh, going to be discussing here. I mean, not only I mean, what constitutes the challenge, but what are also possible solutions to it. Thanks, Max. Uh, so, uh, could I maybe ask you to, um, to respond to the to the two comments. I'll just, perhaps you do it in the same order as you spoke with David Ransomann starting and feel free also to comment on each other's talks, of course. David, please. Uh, okay, sure. So I'll try and just connect those two questions if I may. Um, I suppose there was a dark tone though. I think, I don't think in, uh, in a sense that's what I was talking about. It's easy to feel that we're in the dark phase of this, but there's, there's light as well as dark, I think. Um, so I think one way to connect these two uh, there's a question about the sort of geopolitical setting and, and one way it's possible to get frustrated here is these are all to use a colloquialism i hope this translates chicken and egg problems and that there's a feeling that somehow you know we need a better democracy in order to rescue our democracy from what's happened to our democracy we need a better international order in order to preserve our democracy within an international order and one can get a bit despairing in that context what comes first so i think another way to think about this that connects the two is in terms of risk profile what do we think is most dangerous? What do you, where do we think we can afford to take chances? And where do we think that we need to be cautious? And I think that what has slightly gone wrong with our mindset, if I can use that in a very general sense, is that we've become very risk averse around democracy itself, in the sense that the storming of the capital is emblematic moment. The, the theatrics of it, of course, remind us all of democratic failures that are catastrophic. And yet, American democracy is in better shape than it was six months ago. And American democracy quite comfortably survived what was a farcical as well as a grotesque event. 
and uh, the institutions are intact, although they were, you know, they were battered, but they are intact. And I would say that actually some of those themes in the first question, we, uh, you know, the real risks we run are not that our democracy is going to fall apart, but that our natural habitat is going to be destroyed, that some of our social values will be undermined. And I think a danger that we have had in recent years, particularly maybe the last five years, is to think that we have to hold on to the democracy we've got because the worst thing that could happen is that would unravel and then everything else would follow. Whereas I think there's a danger that we hold on to the democracy we've got past the point where it's actually adaptable in these circumstances and that we ought to be willing to take a chance with it, to disrupt it in various ways, to, to open it up in various ways. And these institutions in particular, which have actually, I think in the last 30 years, I was trying to suggest this in my talk, been more robust than we thought. I mean, there's, I think relative to 30 years ago, if you took someone from 1990 and showed them our world, they would be doubly astonished by how much has changed in almost everything and how little has changed in the institutions of our democratic life. That sort of 90 percent of what we might do is unrecognizable to someone from 1990. You know, the newspapers move and talk and talk back to us and as it were, we're surrounded by visual and oral forms of communication, imagery and so on that would have seemed like science fiction and yet you look at our politics and it's so familiar in so many aspects. And so I think to connect the two questions, we should maybe be more confident that our democracies are not on the brink of a collapse back into fascism. That was my point, that, this, that we're falling back. I don't like the language of backsliding and the idea that what happens is that we go into reverse. If we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail forward. We're gonna fail into the future. We're gonna fail in new ways. And part of the point of democracy, one of its features, it's meant to be is meant to be surprising, unpredictable, and experimental. And we've lost that. Not everywhere, and at the local level, there's much more of it. There's much less of it at the national level, and at the international level, there's almost none. And I think we can take some chances with our democracy because that's less dangerous than taking chances with our world. Thank you. Mi Mireille, would you like to? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, um, about a dark tone, I'm, I'm always hoping that <clears throat> I don't fall into the trap of coming out with some sort of technological or economic determinism, but I don't think we can take democracy for granted. So the fact that <clears throat> the American democracy has turned out resilient, I think it could have been very different. Um, and this is something I believe we have to remember every day. Now, when I look at a long time ago and today, I think what makes it interesting is to say there's always continuity and discontinuity. And the challenge is to see where does the continuity sit and where does the discontinuity sit. And we're here discussing technologies. And I think it's important to look at the different affordances of what computer code automated decision making and data driven decision making, what it affords compared to a long time ago also together with the hyper-connectedness that we're in. And I think, uh, so the hyper-connectedness is, is related to the internet and to the World Wide Web, which has been with us for a long time. But these new technologies uh, like um, blockchain, which is a dangerous term to use because uh, one could say the hype is already over, but I'm not so sure about that. I think it's now being implemented by many big companies and also by governments. And on the other hand, the data-driven technologies that based on this um, belief in behaviorism, uh, in a belief in, for instance, machine learning, a belief that makes itself come true because governments believe it, um, Facebook believes it, etc. I don't believe it. I think much of what we are seeing now is the result of exploratory 
research sold as uh, reliable applications. And I think if you speak with computer scientists who know the inner working of this stuff, they will confirm that. That's why I like the idea of epistemic uh, chaos, because this is what has resulted from these type of technologies. I do not think that many people were manipulated in any direct sense, like Mr. A has been manipulated to behave like this, but I believe that a confusion has entered uh, our public sphere that is being manipulated at a population level, so group levels, that ends up people having no idea who they can trust. I remember a colleague of mine saying, do you know why people like Trump? This was a couple of years ago. Well, because everybody is lying, but at least he's honest about it. <laughs> now, that might be a nice joke, but the point here is the confusion. So post-truth politics is afforded by uh, an infrastructure of technologies that we have to come to the conclusion at some point that we are being taken for a ride. So behavioral advertising. Uh, I think at this moment still many people believe that it works. But when you look at who's actually getting rich on it, it's a very small uh, set of actors. That's the advertising intermediary. The advertisers, the publishers, so the advertisers, that's those are trying to sell stuff, toothpaste, whatever, but also the publishers, so the websites, New York Times, etc. They are not really getting rich on this at all. There is no proof that this works at all. Now, this ecosystem of trying to manipulate, you could say that the success is of the marketeers selling the idea that this works. And this has then moved from the private sphere into the public sphere. So the idea that you can manipulate people into voting. And there in the public sphere, it creates this, this total chaos. But it derives from this initial pseudo-religious belief that this sort of targeting works. And as long as we are continuing with that belief, it's, it's going to continue to pollute uh, disrupt and destroy the public sphere. And I think the idea that we will find a new way to deal with that and will solve the problem, it, it's a nice idea, but let's have a good look. Let's see where we are in a different situation. What are the different affordances of these technologies? Not in any uh, determinist sense. <clears throat> it's much more interesting than that. Um, but also not by saying, oh, it's always been the same, or we will always uh, come to a resolution of the situation. We cannot assume that. And we will really have to look into the heart of these technologies. Yeah, thank you. So, Shoshana Zuboff, maybe you would like to reply too. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so, first of all, I'd like to say hello to Marie and, and hello to David. David, it's nice to see you again after such a long time. Marie, so happy to be with you. Um, I would say that my, my analysis of the situation is quite different from uh, what has been said. My analysis of the situation is that, the, the that we're talking about effects and that the cause of the effects is an economic logic, its imperatives and the operational mechanisms that um, are, have been institutionalized to fulfill those imperatives. Um, this is a problem that can be solved. This is not inherently about technology. Of course, technology has affordances, but the, the, you know, the, the reason we recognize that technology has affordances is that we recognize that these affordances um, operate over a wide landscape and some can be uh, amplified and others can be uh, suppressed. Um, we know that um, as recently as 2000, 2001, 2002, um, some of the designs for things that are um, 
you know, that, that have come to fruition today, whether it's the smart house or the smart car or, or uh, telehealth or whatever it may be, um, these same concepts before surveillance capitalism took over the economic waterfront, uh, those very same concepts were imagined technologically in very different ways. Uh, the the um, epistemic assumptions of design and engineering were fundamentally different. Assuming with uh, single loop systems and, and, and much simpler systems, assuming that you know, the, the resident of the home was the sole uh, recipient of the data produced by the home and so forth. The, the resident of the body is the sole recipient of the data produced by the body. Um, this, is, this is not, uh, this doesn't strain the imagination. This doesn't require, uh, you know, a, a huge uh, futuristic leap. This is uh, uh, more like, um, uh, um, uh, uh, removing a, a cancer from, from the, the middle of the social fabric before it, metastasi it metastasizes and, and literally infects everything. So, um, you know, this is why it is, it is very clear to me that epistemic chaos is not a necessary outgrowth of uh, even of, of connection. Uh, but it is a necessary outgrowth of how connection is structured today because we have essentially ceded connection to corporations uh, that now manage connection in a very specific way that advantage their own revenue streams and profit objectives. And that is... Um, you know, prima facie evidence in their market capitalization and what Murray was referring to as the, you know, very narrow band of society that has financially profited from uh, what is a, a, a now widespread and deeply institutionalized economic logic, surveillance capitalism. So my view is that uh, though I, I usually try to convey this at the very end of a talk, and I, I didn't want to go too far over time today, so I left it for now. But the fact is that I am extremely optimistic about this because I am inherently optimistic about democracy. And in my view, um, you know, we can analogize to, uh, at least in America, the early 20th century where uh, there was a great deal of despair as to whether or not, um, you know, the 20th century would be a, a, a century of, of feudalism and serfdom. Because at that point in the economic domain, the only rights really that were recognized were the property rights of owners. And the cartels and the trusts and so forth, uh, these huge monopolies appeared to be inevitable outgrowths of industrialization. Uh, they appeared to be something that, you know, could not be fought, that democracy could not survive, that the uh, disequilibrium of power between these corporations and, and not only governments, but, you know, people themselves, you know, was something that simply no one would ever be able to be able to reverse. But those, that disequilibrium was reversed. Nothing is perfect, but certainly um, into the third and fourth decades in America of the 20th century, in, a, in, a, in an American world where there were no workers' rights, there were no consumers' rights, uh, there were no legislative frameworks, there were no institutions to uh, oversee the governance of these things, all of that was invented. It, it, it was kicked off by progressives early in the century the lawyers took over in the New Deal, uh, and and these were centuries of uh, decades, sorry, decades of incredible creativity, incredible construction. Uh, so um, 
I believe that that's where we are today vis-a-vis -vis the digital century. Surveillance capitalism has had two decades of a free run, virtually unimpeded by public law in any meaningful way. A lot of this had to do with the war on terror. A lot of this had to do with the ideologies of, of uh, market privileging, non-regulatory, uh, non-governmental government. But, um, but there it is. And uh, the, the, the situation has changed. Uh, society is becoming, uh, is awakening. Lawmakers are awakening. Uh, this, is, this is about collective action. This is about politics. This is about democratic politics. It's about organizing and uh, it's about power. Mm -hmm. And I think that those forces have been unleashed and they are on the move. Will they be triumphant? I can't say. But do we have a run at it? Can we interrupt and outlaw the, the causes of this uh, chaos, the causes of this post-truth, the causes of the, of the new inequalities of, of knowledge and power, the, 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 the nullification of epistemic rights? Can we interrupt and outlaw this? Absolutely. So I'm, uh, I'm very bullish on democracy. Let me, let me maybe uh, just throw in one question. We are, we are getting questions from people who are, who are following the conference online. Uh, there, there's no way I can, I can bring all these questions here, but, but I'm going to try to maybe bring uh, a few. And it strikes me that when you describe uh, the task ahead, you know, something that may be starting, but, but you're also talking about something that lies in the future, something that must be done but has not yet been done. But there are a few questions here about uh, recent legislation in Europe, for instance, GDPR legislation, or antitrust interventions on a regional level. Uh, do you feel that there is already legislation being done, being enacted, that is actually doing the job you're describing? Um, I, I do. Uh, so this is, you know, the first principle. The digital has to live in democracy's house. Uh, we've, for a whole lot of reasons that I won't go into, you know, we've, we've, we've bought into this mythos of cyberspace, uh, celebrated by the tech leaders as the last ungoverned space, uh, not subject to terrestrial law. And um, this is a, a mythos that is simply, a, you know, a rhetoric of power. And uh, there is no cyberspace. There's, there's capital, there's, there's machines, there's knowledge, and there's people. But there is no space that is somehow you know, untouchable by our laws. Every set of democratic rights and laws uh, that exist uh, must be adhered to in, in every setting, in every domain. And uh, so this, this idea that uh, the digital must live in democracy's house we are beginning to see movement. You know, I, I've said that I regard the third decade as, as a critical time to begin to reverse the dynamic here. They've had the first two decades and, uh, and democracy now begins to take hold in the third decade. And uh, when we look at the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, uh, in, the, in the European Union, which are now before the European Parliament, um, these are, uh, these, are, these are not the last word, but these are a huge leap forward in asserting democratic governance over the digital, over the algorithms, over these companies' extractive mechanisms. They create the, a context where the, for the first time, we can begin to look upstream and contest the fundamental illegitimacy of extraction rather than where we have been, which is downstream arguing about, you know, the, the um, arguing about the, the details of their ownership of data, you know, is it accessible? Is it portable and so forth? We're, we're, we're arguing about the downstream details assuming that this gets to already be their private property. And that is a fundamentally illicit assumption. 
they took it, they stole it. We didn't give it. It's not data. It's not data. Data is what's given. So that belongs to us. And with charters of epistemic rights, we decide what is shared, if it is shared, to whom it's shared, for what purpose. Mm -hmm. Because privacy is the effect of which epistemic rights are the cause. So we have all this work to do upstream. And I think that these new legislative uh, frameworks finally put us in a position where we can begin to move upstream to contest these fundamental foundations of surveillance capitalism, which are illegitimate. And finally, I would say that, you know, everybody knows that America has been late to this party. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to say that democracy is now on the move in the United States as well. In fact, today, as, as we speak, um, you know, we're having a two a joint subcommittee hearing in Congress today with the tech executives exploring epistemic chaos, disinformation. Um, will the hearings uh, get to where they need to go? Probably not. But is it important that we're having them? Yes. The antitrust suits that have been brought by not only the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission, but uh, the attorneys general across uh, this country. Um, again, antitrust is not, in my view, the solution, but it does mean that democracy is on the move and the tech companies are put on notice. They are not going to have a free ride for the coming decade. That is critically important. Mm -hmm. So I believe we're already moving in the right direction. Public opinion is there. You look at the surveys, you look at the polls, and what we are seeing now is a wholesale rupture of faith between the American public and the tech sector. I'm talking about 70th, 80th, 90th percentiles of, of Americans who say no trust, no faith, they, they, they violated us, uh, and we have no belief that they uh, will be able to fix this. Uh, something else has to fix that. And that something else is going to be democracy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we are all already on the road. The toothpaste is out of the tube. It's not going back. David, Can I to this yes, in please. Terms of, yeah. From the European perspective, mm -hmm. please. <laughs> so I think uh, the epistemic rights, for instance, are already integrated in uh, both the GDPR and uh, in some way also in uh, the Charter of the European Union. Uh, the yes. rights to certain yes, absolutely. transparency, which are, of course, all about power, as you say. Uh, they've been with us since 1995. Of course, for a very long time, they were not implemented at all. Um, but I think with the GDPR, we are in a much better place. My position is, for instance, that, as I explained, a lot of the rot that is in the system. So I don't believe in uh, economic or technological or even political science determinism. Democracy is not going to do it all by themselves. We will have to do it. And the same goes for technology. I think the rot sits in the behavioral targeting. <clears throat> and uh, I would be in favor of a complete ban on the use of machine learning on behavioral data, which is indeed sneaked from us. Uh, it can bring wonderful things in exceptional and targeted circumstances, but what we are doing at this moment um, doesn't work. Maybe it's interesting to say that the Data Governance Act that has now been proposed, both the watchdog in Europe have said, oh my God, that here we see the pseudo-religious belief. If we give everybody lots of data, data that will very easily be outdated, incorrect, biased, unreliable, and then everybody starts building their funny off the shelf stuff with that. It's going to create more than epistemic chaos. It's going to create physical harm, et cetera, et cetera. What I like is that the Federal Trade Commission has um, decided a couple of months, I think, ago that a company that had collected uh, photographs of people in some uh, because of some persuasion, I think they, they could do some sort of test, whatever. 
they had taken those photographs and then they, they had used them for a totally different purpose or sold them or whatever. Now, the decision of the Federal Trade Commission was that that was uh, uh, unlawful. Um, but the most interesting thing is that they were required to destroy the data, to destroy the models, and to destroy what had been produced with those models. And I told my friends, I said, look, the United States is passing us over because this is going to send the right signal. I mean, if you think economic incentive structure, this is what is going to help. If you tell somebody you work with data that you have, that, you, that you're processing unlawfully, then not only we will make you destroy the data, but everything you built on it. Now here, I think we really need to think in terms of economic incentive structures, and we should be a bit more bold. I totally agree with that. But it's, it's very important to see that the European Commission speaks with different voices. So um, I think even today, the European Parliament, or it was yesterday, but I think it was just today, European Parliament has decided not to vote in favor of watering down the GDPR. So there was a proposal within the European Parliament to say, oh, but the GDPR is old fashioned. It's obstructing our access to innovation. And it brings in the issue of the geopolitical situation. Um, <clears throat> so there is forever this story that's going around in Europe. Oh, but there is the United States and there is China. And now we have to do all this innovation because otherwise they are going to do it. And that's such a dangerous argument. Absolutely. Which is not to say that it's never the correct consideration to take into mind, but Europe should make up its own mind. We should get our own act together. Um, and we should make sure that this behaviorist idea that at the root of neoliberalism, James Buchanan got the Nobel Prize for public choice theory. The assumptions of that theory inform this sort of capitalism. It's the Chicago schools. And if we are going to try and throw out those politics, but continue to have this religious belief in um, behaviorism and the data science that builds on it. So you can build wonderful data science, but you don't need to build on this um, very reductive and extremely problematic stuff where you have to create proxies all the time to be able to help the computer to understand things where democracy will then have to sit down and say, is this the right proxy? That will then become the question. So you can bring this into democracy, but if we're then going to be talking about how to translate what concerns us into computer code, I'm, I'm not sure. Eh? So uh, the jury is out, but I'm not sure that's going to be the way forward. So I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist by nature. Otherwise, I wouldn't even sit here. But the challenges that are in front of us are enormous. And the uh, forces that are out there, the incentive structures that are still in place um, are enormous. And I see Europe and I see the United States and of course many other, and let's not only talk about this part of the world, um, where within democracy, as it should be, there are many different voices uh, and, and we're sort of on this threshold. Uh, and I, as a person, I'm an optimist, but I will never take for granted that democracy is going to survive here. That would be extremely dangerous, I think. Can I, can I say something very briefly? Because I'm aware that we don't have much time. Um, I just want to pick up on the, I think the analogy with early 20th century America is really interesting and gives lots of grounds for hope. Democracies can do amazing things. I think there are two sort of disanalogies there. One is that that did go along with a lot of institutional innovation, as Shoshana said, and we're not seeing that now. So we're seeing policy innovation in very constrained institutional settings, and we need more institutional innovation. We have to 
do politics differently as well as doing policy differently. Well, this isn't going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is that the trusts that were being busted in the early 20th century couldn't really claim themselves to be a form of democracy. I mean, they could say they were bringing cheaper oil or whatever, but basically it was bogus. That point I made that there is a background assumption there is competition between two kinds of democracy going on here. Even if you think it's fake, the claims to the, the, the cyberspace version are still there. And we have to recognize that part of what's disrupting our politics is the ability of the tech giants for you know, plausibly or implausibly to stake a claim to creating a space of empowerment. And if we're gonna take that down, which we should, because I think it is bogus, we have to recognize it's a different kind of political challenge because what we've seen over the last five to 10 years is that claim itself is disruptive. So I think there is a lot of grounds for hope, but I do think this time is different. Thanks. I, I think there, I, I'm just gonna, I just have to say this David. <laughs> I think there was a time up until just a few years ago where what you said um, was still true, but I just don't see that being being true any longer that they can what what they what they can offer is a is a a, a solution they their idea of computational governance as a substitute for democratic governance offers a kind of solution to the chaos and the things that trouble us in our daily lives. So they are the Cheshire cat in that regard, uh, but their ability to promise anything like democracy at this point, empowerment and so forth, uh, I, I think they've blown past that and uh, thankfully so have we. That's. That's my view. Do they want to govern? Absolutely. And will they try to bribe us with their, uh, you know, the equivalent of the uh, existential cappuccino? Uh, absolutely. Um, can we uh, can we resist that? Jury's out. Mm. But that's where the activism and the politics, as Murray says, this isn't given to us. This is something we have to fight for. Right. Said Max. Whatever. I think that last point was extremely interesting. I mean, the question of uh, can we resist that? Um, because I think, I mean, I mean, in the presentations and also in the discussion, it seems like we focused a lot on regulation. I mean, basically the question of what can the state do to counter these developments that we've been observing over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years or even, even more. Um, and that has kind of left the... Uh, the role of the individual out a little bit. And I think that's always a very interesting question to discuss in, in contexts that are, I mean, this one or, or similar contexts. And it also brings me to the question of basically, I mean, uh, we've been talking a lot about reg regulation, but I mean, do we also need to talk about education in this, uh, in mm -hmm. this context? Because it seems to me that, um, I mean, it is clear that, I mean, the, the phenomena that we're describing have very, I mean, are very multifaceted. I mean, they have many different dimensions. Um, we even need to, in a sense, distinguish a little bit more between kind of the, the different aspects of the concepts that we're talking about. But I mean, there's certainly a psychological dimension to this. Uh, there is certainly a, dim a dimension to this that has to do with, uh, with education, citizenship education, especially. I mean, how do we prepare citizens, I mean, not just young people, but basically any kind of democratic citizen for their role in democracy, knowing that this, this phenomenon of the digital is, is something that's not going to go away. And because it's not going to go away, also the phenomenon of disinformation is not going to go away. Uh, and it's basically too much to simply ask, I think maybe it goes without saying that it's too much to ask for us to simply all quit doing what we're doing. Uh, don't use social media anymore, don't give all that information to Mark Zuckerberg uh, or people like this. But uh, I mean, anybody who has children also knows that it's extremely difficult to, uh, to on the one hand, raise awareness for the dangers uh, at the same time as drawing attention to, uh, to the temptation. So I think, I mean, that's kind of where this, where this argument comes from. I mean, can we resist it? Uh, well, the jury is still out. I completely agree. And um, 
but uh, I mean, the question that, that comes out of this is basically what, what do we do beyond regulation? I mean, what do we do in terms of education? Uh, is there something that we, that we can do beyond regulation, basically? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to pick up on the uh, analogy between the, uh, the, the current moment and the early 20th century, which I think is a really good one. Um, and another one of those analogies is, of course, the, uh, the uh, idea that data is the new oil. You know, if oil is the crucial resource of the uh, industrialism of the early 20th century, you know, data being the one uh, most relevant now. Um, and I think that may be, you know, we can debate whether the extent to which that analogy fits, but if, um, um, but I think the challenge is, today, or maybe created, nobody in the early 20th century, I think at least, um, argued against drilling for oil, for example, or distributing oil. But some of the arguments we have to make today, I think, are about saying that, you know, not all kinds of data should be collected, not all kinds of behavioral data or, or biometrical, biometrical data should be indeed collected, and it should not be, you know, harnessed to empower machine learning and so forth. So I think I agree with the point that, so while the analogy is fascinating, I think the challenges today are in many ways greater than in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I wonder also, um, there are a few questions here on, uh, from, from people listening and about, um, uh, about the possibility of, of creating uh, neutral spaces, creating uh, public spaces through the internet that are somehow free from the dangers and, and, and chaos, from the epistemic chaos that we're talking about. Something that's obviously much less than going against uh, surveillance capitalism, but, but is uh, in a way an attempt to get back to the idea of, of public debate, uh, digitalized for sure, but somehow more protected than what we have today. What do you think about, about something like that? Right. Sorry, can I, um, I have to do a very analog thing as we come out of lockdown, which is I have to collect a child. <laughs> so I was sticking to our original timetable, which is that I would be, have to go at five. So um, yeah. I have to apologize for that reason. Um, I also, I also have a, a, another event in four minutes. So. We will not go beyond five. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean to, to that, I would say that, you know, I think, so one of the things I, I want to say here is, I, and I think we've touched on this, um, I think history is important. And I mean, thinking about ways in which democracies have reinvented themselves in the past is important. And one of the great lies of the rhetoric of the tech revolution is that everything is different now, and it's not. And that this is a sort of unhistorical moment, and it's not. And that there are rich traditions we can draw on, including traditions, I mean, we've heard about it earlier, of deliberation, of ways of thinking about what it would be to create a space in which human beings are free from some of their worst impulses, some of their cognitive biases, in which a form of discourse is possible, which is democratic in the highest sense. And this technology should afford that. That's part of the original optimism. And the original optimism was for real. As I tried to say, I think our having abandoned the original optimism is itself a mistake. But it is going to be difficult, and it's it's extraordinarily because we've heard about this already. Extraordinary, complex, overlapping sort of challenges. But Shoshana said, "This decade is the crucial decade. But this decade is the crucial decade for so much. <laughs> I kind of feel sorry for this decade. Yeah. I feel sorry for what this decade has to do. I feel sorry for what this American administration has to do. I feel sorry for what the European Commission has to do. Our children. Challenges are overwhelming, interconnected problems." Yeah. Uh, it would be great to carve out that space. We have to prioritize not just risk, but we also have to prioritize absolutely what we think we can afford to do and what we think we can't afford to wait on. And it's the things that we can't afford to wait on that are most important. And I don't think we're there yet. I mean, I think we you know that that checklist is too long for us to know. But you know, if I want to make a case for democracy, I think we should put that out to the people. I mean, I think we haven't done enough of asking the people what risks they're willing to bear. And so there is a case that the solution to the problems of democracy are more democracy, but that does mean a kind of genuine openness to change. And I don't think we're quite there yet as democracy. It's, it's just been pointed out to me that I was wrong about when we were supposed to end. I thought we were 
scheduled to end at five, but we were actually scheduled to end at quarter to five. So uh, let's wrap this up. I, I'm inclined to give everyone a chance to say something very briefly at the end. Also, I'm going to count that as my last word. If okay, right. then you're, you're excused then. Thank you so much and thank you for <laughs> thank you. fascinating. And also, uh, unfortunately, uh, Katrin Jakobsdottir was not able to join us. Apparently, it is not any less uh, difficult to be a prime minister in a small country than a big one. <laughs> so she has been uh, uh, busy, unfortunately. But uh, Svet, Max, uh, Shoshana and Mireille. Au revoir. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. I've, en I've enjoyed it. And uh, courage. <laughs> uh, lots of lots of uh, energy around the world uh, to uh, preserve the best idea that humanity has had so far, and that is democracy. So um, I look forward to uh, to uh, seeing you all in in uh, future conversations and future activity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Let me repeat that I hope that democ democracy is not going to be reduced to a discussion about how to turn what we care about into computer code, but that we have the real conversation with real people and that we um, uh, tune and maybe um, reconfigure the economic and technological incentive structures that are now blocking the way to that. Um, and yes, that's a very complex challenge. Thank you. Max. Thank you very much. It was all super interesting. <laughs> and thank you, Jon and, and everyone for putting this together. I think this is a really, really good event. Thanks. Well, let thank me you. thank you, uh, the participants and, and everyone who has been joining us online for uh, great talks and a good discussion. And uh, let me also remind everyone that we are continuing tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, Reykjavik time, GMT. We will have uh, four talks uh, then and, uh, and a panel discussion as well, ending at four in the afternoon or about four. So thanks.